So uh, thank you all for rising early um, and, and coming to this talk. Uh, though I know you really came to hear uh, Krista's introduction, uh, which hopefully uh, I will manage to add some, some marginal value to that. Uh, so live literate programming. Uh, I want to start by establishing a few facts that might be controversial. Uh, all other things being equal, it is better to be live than dead. Uh, also, all other things being equal, it's better to be literate than illiterate. Sadly, for the state of mainstream programming, current practice is both dead and illiterate. And so the question is, what, what can we do for programming? Can we resuscitate it? Can we educate it so it will be literate? You know, it's a Sisyphean struggle, but uh, we try. So where shall we begin? Uh, once upon a time, the technology for literacy and for books was rather basic. And things basically had to be done by hand. So every character in a book had to be inscribed by hand by a skilled calligrapher. And consequently, books were on the expensive side. And uh, being expensive, <coughs> that, 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 that has, it's a different model. It has advantages. Uh, the residual cost of adding beautiful artwork to books, given how expensive they already were, was relatively low. So we had this age of illuminations. And you know, throwing a little bit of gold leaf on it, you know, doesn't really add much to the cost either. And so, you know, if, if something's really costly, people invest in it. On the downside, if books were expensive and therefore rare, and therefore literacy was rare. Well, at least you could argue it's the downside. Um, and so um, even today, I'd argue that most of you, perhaps none of you, can, you know, most of you can't read this. Maybe no one here can read this except me. Uh, I don't know, there are, there are a couple of people I met in the hall. Oh yeah, yeah there are a few who can't read this. So, uh, those of you with a mathematical inclination might uh, recognize this character, uh, you know, Alif Nur, uh, or uh, Alif Not, I guess, in the English-speaking world. But I'll make it easier for you and translate it. So. And uh, so we're, this is uh, this is an illumination from 1482. Uh, the Lisbon Bible, it's in the British Library, and they have a wonderful website where you can actually leaf through this and see it almost as if you, know, as if you had that thing in your hand. Uh, so using, essentially, explaining that same book in a technology that I dare say the people who created the book would have had a hard time envisioning. And so, uh, yeah, this is the beginning, but uh, things have changed. Change is the one constant, right? Uh, so, you know, since then there was a printing press and, flip, you know, it, it was a technological change that made everything, you know, the books a lot cheaper and literacy became a lot more common and it gave us a lot of other things, I think, arguably, the Reformation, the Hundred Years War, all kinds of good things happened. Um, but, uh, as I say, everything changes and at some point, uh, certain books became expensive again. Uh, not ex that expensive to sell, though when I got these, they did seem expensive to me. Uh, but they were expensive to produce. So I, I don't know how many people here know, know the story. At least this is a story that I've heard. And, and uh, Don Kroof, when he wrote The Art of Computer Programming, which is what these books are, if you, you, know, you still can't make it out no matter how much I do, but believe me, it's The Art of Computer Programming, right? It's classic work. Uh, the first edition was done in the 60s and typeset, I guess, in lead type or something by master typesetters. And when the second edition came around in the 70s, uh, Addison Wesley sent the proofs to Professor Knuth and he was appalled by what he saw because the quality of the typesetting had gone down the tubes. And this was because it was too expensive to typeset it the old way. Because a book like that that has all these mathematical formulas starting to worry about the fact that your italic Greek 
letters in the superscripts or subscripts match the main size and the font and everything. So you need to arrange this and each, each formula is a little different and you need to put spacers in the lead and everything. It's very labor intensive and, and very costly to produce. So they just cut some corners. Uh, and if, if you were a mere mortal like me or, or most of you, you just say, grumble, grumble, books aren't like they used to, type system. You know, type systems are not <laughs> type setting isn't what it used to. You know, you go home, have a beer, and, and complain. But John Lewis is not a mere mortal, and so he just said, let's reinvent the technology underlying all this and just fix it. Uh, something to this, I have a sort of biblical thing here. Now, this, this is not actually strictly true. Uh, because, in fact, computerized typesetting existed before it was, uh, there was T-Rof. And if you, you know, uh, want to think that the world is going to hell in a handbasket and, and it's the worst, it can always be worse is a good perspective. Imagine if Knuth had stuck with T-Rof, right? I think he made a substantial improvement by, by starting afresh, which is also an important lesson. You start afresh, bulldoze things, you know, that, that's always a good thing. So, you know, what he actually said is that, or to some, to some extent, and they're lovely books too. And I have a soft spot for this because my <coughs> undergraduate senior project was to implement uh, a, sub, a small subset of Metafont. And uh, so, so I got attached to, to that, and uh, that's actually how I, how I came to have these guys because I had an uncle who was working in the United States, and I asked him for the Metafont book, which was really hard to find. You know, there was no Amazon, you know, this is the, the early Stone Age. <laughs> and he went to, to the uh, bookstore, McGraw-Hill had a big bookstore in New York, and he went in, and they didn't have it. But the salesman said, but I have something by the same author that I mean, if it, it's a computer science student, he really liked, and he sold him this, you know, what was then very expensive, like a uh, hundred something dollars for three volumes. Uh, the, the set, and he brought me this, and I said, that's fabulous. It isn't what I need, but, but yeah, it's great. So, I, and I still have them. Uh, so, that was a good thing. But remember, the books, the original books that motivate all of this were not these. These are the product of this, or, but, but uh, the book was called The Art of Computer Programming. And so, yeah, what about the programs, right? So you still have to get them into, you still have to get them into this, this document that you're typesetting. And so uh, you have to go, you'd like to go find a program. Where do you find things? You go where they live. The thing is they live in registers and actually dynamic processes and machines. And that is hard to extract. It was certainly harder to extract back then. Uh, though there were already early Lisp, well, Lisp and not that early Lisp, but Lisp and, and small talk, but they was early days. So instead you have to go to these dark subterranean catacombs where, where the dead programs are. They're, they lay there quietly in eternal silence. And you have to basically, it's like a medieval anatomist, you have to take these bodies up and put them in the light and, and give an anatomy lesson about this program. So you carve it open and say, here's the heart. And it beats. Well, it isn't beating now, and, but, but it would beat if it was alive. And you have to imagine all this. And that's what happens with programming today. You have to look at this and imagine what it does when it's actually a dynamic thing while you look at this, the, this that this dead thing called a file. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the theme of death will also be a, a popular theme in, in this talk, because we, we, we should always be mindful of it, because it's very easy to create dead software, and we, we need to focus on the fact that it should be live, and that always is it's harder, generally speaking. Well, I don't know, but I think it's harder to be alive than dead. Uh, I'll tell you later. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, we came up with this idea of literate programming. And the point was to, to be able to combine the, the presentation, of, to present the program, to get an exposition that made sense from the perspective of telling this, what, what this thing does to a human, as opposed to telling what it does to a compiler. And that's the fact that there are humans involved in this is something that is, you know, most uh, as an engineering task, we lose, we lose sight of that. Uh, so this is good, this was nice, uh, but in the end, you know, these things were, yeah, they could not actually, they did not make the programs alive, they just took them out of their catacombs and, and put them on display. 
But you know, technology you know, moves on. And so uh, we now have e-books and we sort of would expect to have interactive visualizations and simulations in the books and so on. Well, the actual state of e-books, if you look at a, a typical book like I have a, an e-book like guidebooks now for, for my visit to Europe, and uh, they have maps, dead maps sitting there that they, they sort of scan from their original book or something, right, where you'd expect to have, you know, Google Maps or, or some such uh, facility. So we want, we want live stuff, and in particular programs, we want programs we can interact with. We can actually see what they do. We want to see the heart beating. And so this is not a new idea either. This idea actually precedes Knuth's work. It, it actually precedes Tiroff. It, it's from really the early 70s, right? And Alan Kay predicted this, and I say prophesied, because there, you can't say he invented it or discovered it or anything. You read the stuff that Alan wrote in 1971, 1972, and it describes essentially uh, modern cell phone companies, it describes Google, it describes advertising-based data centers that are connected through wide area networks and, and sell through advertising and talks about advertising filters and a lot of stuff that was, uh, you know, not obvious in 1971, so it's, it's a good idea to actually, it's, it's interesting to go uh, read those, those original pieces. And part of that was the Dynamo, right, which essentially predicted laptops and tablets and such. And a lot of Alan's motivation was education. But one of the things that, that people need to remember is if you read that stuff, it's very clear that it wasn't just about others educating people, like exposition. It was also about people educating themselves, having tools so they themselves could interact and, and learn how things work directly. And that is, is very much in the spirit of liveness, which later got realized partially in, in for example, small talk and other systems, but can always be built upon. But it also had this idea of, of education and documents and exposition. So it's all about, you know, the medium that we have, the medium changes, and we need to, to take advantage of that medium. And usually it takes a long time for people to take advantage of a new medium. Right? Uh, again, one of my, my, my first job after undergraduate school was doing uh, CAD software for circuit design. And at the time, this was a new thing, and, and practicing engineers, they used to, to draw their circuits on mylar, which is a transparent plastic. I think it's not nodding, because he's the only one here who actually remember right there. Yeah, there are a handful. We won't mention any more names, but there are people who actually do remember this. And one of the things we encountered there was uh, the mylar being a finite space. At some point, you'd have to end it, and then you'd mark it with an arrow saying, going to sheet so-and-so. And we didn't have this problem. We were doing this on a computer, and we'd get them this sort of infinite canvas where the whole circuit can be. And we got people complaining about this. Like, why don't you have a structure this in pages like I'm used to, right? It's like, what are you talking about? But, but people have a hard time evolving at some stage to, to new things, and so these things take a long time. And so, liveness is taking a very long time, but I do think that uh, it'll get there. And, and we're say we're making progress is a bit over-optimistic, but we, things, are, things are moving in that direction somehow. So there have been life signs, and the part of the pun, uh, for a long time. Uh, Mathematica actually has a very nice notion of, of notebooks. The problem with Mathematica is it costs money, and therefore everyone ignores it. Uh, there are now Jupyter notebooks. There are F sharp Azure, which I think is somehow derived from Jupyter, but, but deployed by Microsoft and so forth. But again, there is more to this than, than that interaction. There is more to a live program than just you know, typing it and, the, and having it run the results and, and having a REPL. Uh, there's a lot of, of intermediate states that get created. There are heaps of stacks you want to investigate. There are a lot of things that these environments really don't really deal with. Uh, there are steps forward. So Amber Smalltalk, for example, is a small talk on the web. It's not quite a full fledged small talk, but it's early days. Uh, there's a really intriguing system called Eve, uh, which uh, some people in San Francisco are, have, have put out. Uh, in general, at, at this point, I find that some of the most interesting programming language work happens outside of academia. And Eve, in particular, is lots of interesting things about Eve. Go look it up. But uh, in particular, uh, they actually have put uh, 
of la uh, literate programming as a major feature. They actually structure their things as documents. And I, that, that, that they're very brave people. I actually am not so optimistic about that part. Live programming, uh, you know, the eventual triumph is only a matter of time. Literate programming, I, I, I will argue for it, but the idea of convincing most of the world's programmers to be literate, uh, I've worked with it for too long. Uh, I, I think that it, it's going to be a niche, really. But, but uh, this audience, I believe, is, is, is actually the right audience for this stuff. So what's wrong with these things, and why, why, why I think there's some things that need to go further? Uh, so basically, we're talking about a way of, of you know, creating documents with, with live programs in them, so we can talk about them, and they're editors. And these editors, most editors, have a compos compositionality problem. Most software has a compositionality problem, but that's a different story. Uh, so, you know, we, we basically need an editor that contain, can contain widgets in it, right? We want to put, like, you know, actual things that run inside our text and interact <coughs> so say, a class browser or something like that. Uh, but we also oops, <coughs> have to consider the fact the editor itself is a widget. So in my, my class browser, the method browsers, for example, or however you want to present it, and then again, that's an editor, and I should be able to keep nesting these indefinitely. And if I realize that the editor contains widgets and an editor is a widget, that just happens. That's, that's what happens when you have sort of clean, uniform definitions, which people tend to somehow avoid, like the plague, uh, because it's usually the path of least resistance is some special purpose hat. And so most ed editors will give you, you know, text and can't do this. Uh, otherwise, you know, we'd already be there. So uh, we're going to start with a very old demo of something, uh, you know, I participated in, you know, in a millennium long ago. And uh, let's see, which window did it go to? Right. How readable is this? Can we can make it a bit bigger? Right, so this is, the strong talk was a, a small talk system that was developed by a startup that I worked for that had basically taken the self technology and applied it to small talk at a time where this actually seemed like a viable commercial thing to do. A wonderful time. Um, and uh, just just before Java showed up and and things started to go wrong, you know, when the history of of this time is written, you know, they, they'll. They'll say, when did things go wrong? I think you, you have a date in mind, uh, but I have an earlier date in mind. Uh, so, but this, this is basically the, the system documentation, all written. Uh, this was done, yeah, about 1995, uh, and we were inspired by this newfangled thing that just came out called Netscape. It was a web browser. And so this thing actually runs off a of fake HTML. Uh, it's, it looks, uh, it appears to be some form of HTML, but it isn't. It's a, it's a sub very, you know, HTML-ish thing that, that was actually implemented in, in Smalltalk to, to do this. And it had some applets, Smalltalk applets. Uh, there are probably people here who don't even remember applets. Uh, no, you, you didn't actually miss that much. But it was a big deal at the time because the idea was that you could put, like, Java code that would be running and in the browser, and this was supposed to revolutionize things, and it would if Java worked properly in the browser. But uh, you know, this is it would have been the JavaScript of of the world if it if it actually had functioned properly. Uh, but that's another talk. I have lots to say about that. Uh, but anyway, so so this is kind of a, a, a definition that that defines this this rich text document. And it has some applets, and so here's a right. So this is a a class hierarchy browser that's embedded in the document, right? So this is basically a portal into the the, the small talk IDE that we had at the time. And you can go and you know you can keep browsing the hierarchy, and we'll get to somewhere that I want to go. And you can click on these guys and open up. You know, a class browser on the ordered collection. Let's see, maybe we can make this whole thing a bit bigger. 
And if we look at the comments section, there's something a little bit interesting here. There's a button in it, right? This is before we had this rich text thing that was defined by an HTML sort of format. But this is a, a WYSIWYG plain old text editor, except that it has buttons in it. And this particular button, some lawyers maybe put in when we open sourced the thing. Uh, because it, it was hard to explain to them that, you know, there isn't, it doesn't come up on the command line and print a banner saying this is the property of some microsystems or some such. There, there is no, no room for this, so eventually I convinced them to let me do this. And so you can click on this and you can get their license and uh, read the license if you want to. It's very interesting. Right? So there's a, this is, a, again, a live button inside this, but this is text, right? So I can... Uh, Right? We can type all over this thing. Uh, we can type before it, right? We can backspace and we can backspace over it. And it's gone, right? Uh, and we can also add buttons here, right? So this is kind of fun. small talker, you sort of think I'm going to just evaluate it or something. But the, the, this is kind of a cute little demo that was done at the time, which was, that we, of course we can evaluate it and so forth, but we can also do this. We can turn it into a button. <coughs> and now we can click on it. And we have an inspector on the board of collection, right? So that's kind of nice. The point is, you, you, you know, this is very rudimentary, but it, it's got the right architecture. And you can actually, you know, you could write, we actually did write the system documentation in it, and I'm sure, you know, it could be published. But it's, it's kind of a nice thing, and again, whichever context you're in, it'll kind of uh, do its thing, right? So if I go to this guy, the same thing works in, in wherever it is. And we can, if you, if you look up here, that's <coughs> here for people. We can keep adding threes till we're happy, right? <coughs> so that's that's what every editor should do. Why anyone? Okay, in in 1960, okay, I guess it was complicated, right? But why anyone post 1980 ever wrote a text editor that could only do text? Is you know, right? It's it's a it's a problem of, of composition. So this is this is a basic thing. Uh, oddly, this is one of the, the things the web does well. Uh, it's very it's very <coughs> pain to me to say anything nice about the DOM, uh, but this is something that actually is is fundamentally correct about. So uh, this is uh, this is good, uh, but it, it has limits. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, we had order collection here, right? So. One of the limits is, you know, a, a practical thing I might want to do with this, for, for my value of practical, uh, is that I might want to say, to put comments like, uh, inspect this object, you know, print, type, click, click the word click, you know, again, the same sort of thing. <coughs> Right, and then we go and reference to the typo, and we'll, and we'll go and make it a button again. Right? And then you, you'd like, you'd like this thing to, uh, to be in the, in the code, and you can go and click it. And small numbers do similar things where they have pieces of text that you can evaluate, right? But it's nice to have this button. Uh, let's see what we do. Let me click it. The odd thing is that we it has worked up to a point, except that it hasn't shown us an order collection. It's shown us nil, and this is a problem. Not with the so far we're talking about the literate aspect of things with a text editor with a decent model and so forth. The problem here is a different one. There's a license problem. That the dirty little secret is even in small talk, the code in a class browser is dead. Right, there's lots of ways you can interact with things, but this is dead code, right? It doesn't have a binding for self. 
and it doesn't have a binding for for the parameter e, right? So it's it's sort of you know just a, a text editor, and this is this is a problem. Uh, so somewhere here, I uh, lost track of my windows, but yeah, here we are. Let's see if there's anything that could be done about that. Uh, so this is an experiment I did a few years ago, and there are at least a few people here who, who had the misfortune of seeing it probably in 2012 or so. Uh, but if we go here, uh, okay, right, we started to stop this. There's one more thing I have to do, which is, oh, okay, we're good. Perhaps we are good. So, The idea here, the basic problem is that we should never be looking at bit code. And so, dead code is something that, uh, you know, you, you want to avoid at all costs. And so, you, whenever you look at code, you should be looking through a tool that actually brings it to life. So, you can interact with it, evaluate it, so on, which means you have to have, you know, some sort of binding for, for variables and things like that. So this was an experiment to do that sort of thing. And here I should be able to do things like, you know, since we're fond of, this is mutable array list, which is sort of new speaks order collection. Uh, and I should, we're fond of adding three to collections. So here, here's the list, right? We have a binding of self. That's the, the, the key point here. So if we do this, there, there's a three in there now, right? Because now we actually have, um, you know, values to work with, and we can look at this code and, and play with it and have it do things, and we could do, we could be more ambitious and add E, except E doesn't have a binding, but it's a prototype that I haven't figured out, well, so I did some work on this four years ago and I haven't had the uh, chance to really work on it again. But we can fix that, we can make E, say, 5, and then we can, <coughs> make things, well, we can evaluate this guy again. Right. And we can, and the main point is we can evaluate the actual code that's in the method, right? And now we have another plot, right? And so we can interact with these things always. You know, any code we get, we should be able to pull this off. The interesting thing is, what do you do when you pull something off GitHub or something, and how do you make this happen? Uh, and there, there are there are speculative answers to that, uh, even ones that don't involve destroying GitHub. Uh, so. There are ways of doing this. As you can see, I've got these demos in different places, different pieces, because I've never gotten around to composing the thing that, um, that does it all. Actually, when, when Robert Hirschfeld graciously invited me to, to give this talk, there uh, was a brief moment where I had this delusion that I'll have more time to do this. And that's why I chose this topic, thinking that I have a lot more to show you. But things haven't worked out that way. Uh, so yeah, well, well, you know, those are editors the way I'd like to see them, but you know, this is what we have today. <laughs> and uh, hopefully we'll, yeah, this is about, uh, this again is another, uh, that demo I, I just showed you of the, of the method browsers that actually have live state in them. Uh, this is, uh, I've got a video up on YouTube somewhere where I, I do Brett Victor's binary search example from his famous talk uh, using this stuff. <coughs> So uh, definitely there's room for improvement on the literary front. There's room for improvement on the liveness front and, and lots more to, to say about these things and lots more to think about these things. Uh, but there's also a question, how do you get it into people's hands? And so uh, we, uh, the, 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 the last demo I'm going to show you is, is Ampleforth, which is uh, again a, a little experiment I did with uh, the new speak in the web browser. And Ampleforth, uh, where the name comes from, it comes from here. Uh, that's, this is uh, 1984, which of course has served me uh, as an inspiration for new speak in, in many ways. And uh, there's a character there called Ampleforth, and he's an editor. Uh, I don't know how many. The sales of 1984 have gone up dramatically in the past few months, oddly enough. Uh, so now maybe more people are aware. And if not, go read it. It's, it's, it was timely before, but it's arguably even more timely today. And uh, Ampleforth was a work for the Ministry of Truth, 
And his job was to translate works of literature from old speak to new speak. And so he was a literary editor conversant in new speak, which is exactly what we want. And so here, let's, uh, we'll probably have to zoom this a bit. But basically, th this section right here is a new speak kind of uh, mi miniature ID embedded in the browser. And it has a lot of, uh, you know, has a lot of ways to go. But it, it does some things, and I'll only show the things it does and avoid the <coughs> demonstrating the things it doesn't do. So, uh, yeah, it's probably hard to read, isn't it? But it's also wide, so we can't make it too big. But let's zoom in on or it's, well, we'll see how this goes. No, we can only get, we can't really get. But anyway, uh, so we can evaluate things in workspaces. Uh, so even though Newspeak doesn't have a global namespace, uh, the IDE does and lets you kind of access convenient things. So this is kind of live. Uh, Right, so as I, as I type in evaluators, and you, there's a million examples of this sort of thing, of evaluators like this on the web, and that's sort of a, a REPL-like thing. Uh, but the point is, yes, there's more to it. So here, you may not be able to see that, but that's the result of this, which is three. And if we click on that, we get into an object inspector on three. And we can see what class it is, it's class number, and we can look at code in class number, right? So, oops, yeah, we have a bit of an issue with the, let's see. I'm going to try and do something with this. Move it so it's more centered, maybe it will work better, right? So, yeah, there's a method there. Uh, the other thing we can do is, uh, we've got this link here that says inspect presenter. We click on that we get to an inspector on the object that is doing the presentation, the GUI widget that is actually showing us this thing. Since we were looking at a class, it's a class presenter, and that lets us go click on the class presenter and see the class. So now we can actually look at the code that was responsible for the display of that thing live, which is kind of one of the points of, you know, it's a small thing, but it's a very useful thing. Uh, I've put, tried to put it in every system I've had a chance to since, since Strong Talk. Uh, because uh, if you work with something like Eclipse, you know, the deadly literate sort of mainstream, uh, and you find that there's something that you don't like how it's being displayed, what do you do? Well, you go to GitHub and you or wherever they keep their stuff, and you download this thing, and when the whole monster is there, you spend your life trying to dig through it and figure out where in the code would actually be the thing that was responsible for displaying this thing. You change it, you build it, you come back half an hour later, uh, and then you run it and try and see whether this actually had an effect, and you find out you were wrong, and so forth, right? So it, it's nice that you can actually find out where something is, you know, immediately find out what is responsible for displaying something, and then you can immediately change it. For example, if we were to uh, do this, we'll change the color a bit. And this is a failure of liveness because, in principle, once I accept this, it should have had an effect, but, um, you know, as I said, it's not where it should be. But if we click on it again, Lo and behold, yes, we can actually change. So what, what we've done here is, right, we've changed the behavior of our ID from within the ID while it's running inside the presentation manager that I'm using to display. Which should have been routine decades ago, but isn't, and that's sort of a point of my talk, which it should be routine, right? This is, this is the minimum you should, should be expecting, you know, all along from, from all your software. So, uh, yeah, and, and since there's a reason why we didn't actually choose this color scheme, as you might, you might guess, so let's go and change it back uh, to what it was. Oh, this, yeah, I think that's, that's what it was. And then we'll go and, again, yeah, okay, so now we're back to normal. Uh, and we can always go back to, to our home screen and uh, we can do things there. So we can find out what version we are. Look, uh, yeah, we're this version. I think we'll be stuck on this version for a while. <laughs> um, 
and uh, we can, more importantly, we can actually see the namespace of the IDE, right, all the top level modules that we have in the system. And uh, we can look at, for example, this one, which is part of Ampleforth. And we can kind of get a look at how Ampleforth works. It's pretty simple, really. Uh, so when it starts, it makes a few calls here, and in particular, let's look at, at this one, process mini browsers, which is right up here. And uh, what that does is it basically there's some method again up here, DOM elements with class do, which basically iterates over the elements in the DOM that match a given, you know, have a given tag. And we're looking for a tag called mini browser, and then for each element that matches that tag, we're going to do something. Uh, we're going to basically have this thing called embedded hopscotch window, which is a, a window for the design to be embedded in the browser, where it will basically take that element, stick in the, the necessary <coughs> stuff to actually put in uh, a live Newspeak widget. And the Newspeak widget we'll get will be defined here. In this case, it's a home subject. And a home subject is the thing that we get when we, uh, we click here on home and that sort of the entry point for the ID. So basically, you can stick this more or less in any, well, with some cat, the web is always a joy, but in principle, you can stick it into any web page, you put some where you want, you know, you write your, your, your actual expository text, and you stick in divs that have this tag on it, and then you put a, a link to uh, Ampleforth JavaScript in the uh, Ampleforth is written in Newspeak, as you can see, but we translate it into JavaScript. Then it goes, when the page starts up, it, it goes, looks through, through the DOM and, and replaces all these guys with, with the actual widgets. And uh, yeah, well, and it even with some effort eventually worked in this presentation manager, which is uh, done by a colleague of mine, uh, Bill Burdick, who uh, also is a big fan of live literate programming. He calls it illuminated programming after illuminations. And uh, with some tinkering, thanks to Bill uh, putting it in an iframe and all this wonderful stuff which makes people productive, uh, you know, we, we were able to run the environment. Uh, right here inside the, the browser. So, uh, you know, this is, again, uh, this, this is very simple stuff, really. It just, uh, it just needs to, to be made to, to work, and uh, I'm hoping that, that we'll see progress. And, but there are a few issues here, right? So, so when you think of, okay, what am I actually going to write now that I can actually can embed widgets? What, I actually, what, what am I going to do when I, when I write my lab little program? Well, I'm going to typically uh, in the, the documentation. You know, you want to tell a story. It's a narrative, and you, the story typically says we did this, and it, you know, this didn't work that well because there's this problem, and here's what we do instead, and so forth. So, you essentially end up having versions of a program that you have to reference within the same document. You know, broken versions, half-baked versions, optimized versions, etc. Uh, so, the natural solution, quote unquote. Uh, involves the catacombs. And uh, yeah, we can put different files linked to them. The problem is, you know, that's going to be dead. These files are, are dead, right? And besides, we, we, we haven't had the skulls in, in a slide for a long time. <laughs> so, uh, well, you think version control. Well, sort of, yes, but version control still has <coughs> the same problem. Uh, this, by the way, is the grave of uh, Evita Peron uh, in uh, Recoleta Graveyard in Buenos Aires, which is a lovely place which I recommend visiting, but just as an aside. And you can do that in November, it's a good season, and attend the Small Talks Conference while you're at it, which is what I do. Um, great experience for, for those who like that sort of thing. Uh, that's the thing you like. So, um, yeah, so basically, it's all dead. And so instead, what you can do is uh, have the ID manage this basically by maintaining namespaces. This works well in a language where it, like Newspeak, where it can be live and, and the modules will not interact with each other. Uh, but you can engineer it probably in, in some other way. And then, uh, right, let's uh, back where we were. Right, we, uh, we had this notion of namespaces, right? This is a namespace, top level namespace, but they can nest. So this is the namespace for the icons that it's using, the various images and so forth. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't. If this was set in a normal web page, I'd just press the back button, but I don't, I dare not do that here. I, I just don't know. What to do. So we'll just go back to the, to the later thing. But basically, 
you can set this up with different namespaces where you can have the same class, the same modules, they will not interact with each other because the newspeak modules don't interact. And you can just you just ID manage them in different namespaces, and you you will refer to these namespaces from from your uh, essentially uh, div tag that, that uh, you know the mini browser which one you want, and then you'll be able to have right you know in section one you'll describe one version of the program, and in section two you say well we change this and so forth, and you'll be able to interact live with each version of the program. So that's that's kind of uh, oops what am I doing wrong wrong arrows. So there's also other things that's kind of, a lot of, we have constructs in programming languages that are also about breaking down the, the, the presentation in different ways and organizing it. So inheritance is really a way of describing essentially sequential changes to things. <coughs> and you might want to describe that, again, in, in a narrative fashion as, as one step or another. Uh, aspects are certainly a thing that, that try to to do away with, with the order imposed by conventional compilers in terms of how, where, where you describe what. And that's a problem. When you write a, a description in literate programming, you are often want to take some snippet of something and talk about it completely out of the, the order in which it was traditionally set up. And so this, this uh, should, you know, should lend itself naturally to that. You know, famous last words. Uh, so here's another issue that comes up. Uh, Basically, uh, you know, are you using, you know, WYSIWYG editors? Are you using sort of things that are driven off a, a sort of a, a definition? Uh, we've sort of seen both. Uh, the strong talk thing I showed you first to have this fake HTML. Uh, we saw the, the, the live bit, the regular editor there. Of course, ideally, I'd like to have something nicer. There's also, uh, so one way to use Ampleforth, for example, uh, here's a blog post I wrote a while back, which has the same stuff embedded in it. And the way I create that is because, you know, this I can get to typeset decently because this is using Dan, uh, Dan Lyon and Microsoft has this system uh, called Madoko. And it lets you basically write a mixture of markdown and tech on one side and produce decent looking output on the other. And if you look all right over here, well, I can't get it very big because it's again. Uh, right, so there we are, right? There's a div class, and that now the the, the, the Mendoka integration isn't complete because otherwise, what I'd like to see is the actual browser in, in the other side. Uh, but you could do that. And if you did that, then you would have sort of a view that was let you, you know, edit uh, this sort of source text. But it would still could be a live view. I mean, this is partially live. If I change, if I start changing, uh, you know, this, it's a little slow, but it does uh, eventually change on, on the text side. So it's it's good at handling the text. It doesn't know, know what to do with these raw HTML tags, especially the newspeak ones, but that could be engineered in. So, you basically can, uh, you know, you can make uh, two view editors like this live, in a way, right? And uh, yeah, the uh, this, by the way, is Sarah Bernhardt playing Hamlet. And again, I needed a skull. Uh, so uh, you know, you, you can make them live, but it's nicer, right? The ideal, which many people have tried and failed, right? The, 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 one of the ideal things was to have a tech in a, in a live environment, and we're closer to that with the current tools, but there's no, nothing that's really totally WYSIWYG, right? You, because it's hard to infer back from, from your actions what, what the original tech would be, and the whole power of, of these definitional things is that you have finer control than, than under WYSIWYG, right? But you like to combine them, you like to apply it in both ways. Uh, if you're designing such a system, you have to decide this, you have to decide which, what you're using for your source. Are you going to use Markdown or or uh, HTML, Dev, uh, and uh, and this this uh, presentation manager actually uses a thing called a org mode, which is some some Emacs thing that uh, Bill is fond of. Uh, but again, somewhere there's a piece of text. In fact, I, I can probably show it to you if I change the presentation. Well, well let's live dangerously. This will look like garbage. Uh, hang on. Uh, turn off slide mode, and so here, right, here's a newspeak evaluator, 
And if you look somewhere in here, there is the div class with evaluator as its tag. A mini browser probably has yeah, one with mini browser somewhere. Yeah, div class mini browser, the same as we saw in the Dover, right? So there's a bunch of gobbledygook in here that makes the whole thing somehow a little, you know, because this, this was improvised in the past couple of days so that I could give this presentation rather than using Keynote, which would have been so much easier, but I couldn't embed actual live stuff in it because Keynote is now designed. I, and I couldn't even change that, that heading that I changed at the beginning of the presentation from Hebrew to English because you can't edit it without changing it because it's modal because whoever designed it, well, never mind. Um, so, you know, th this works on the same thing. This apparently is, is org mode that lets you also embed HTML in it and it's, it's complicated. Uh, I don't pretend to understand this particular thing, but it is a presentation manager, manager that I can run in the browser and then you speak in, which is what, what was the point here. Uh, obviously, uh, there are some demos here, some of which I missed. Uh, uh, there's some folks who left, I think, yesterday who were doing their uh, web, web substrate stuff, which actually can do similar things and perhaps is visually a little more polished. Uh, but again, I, I do not have another week to spend figuring out how to integrate it into their thing. Because uh, the beautiful thing about the web, you can do anything if you're willing to bang your head <laughs> long and hard enough. Uh, yeah, so where were we? Hello? Uh, now the question is, have we broken it? No, it still appears to work. Or not? Oh uh, yeah, I did say we were living dangerously, didn't I? Uh, well, we can do another thing. If all else fails, we can bring it all back how we started, I think, at this point. Yeah. So we just go back to where we were. <coughs> the last few slides. <coughs> and we're there. So another <coughs> nice thing I like about, about these systems, right, is you know, enough of the dead, stupid te text editors. Because they they constrain language design in horrible ways. Right? You can't really do, do real languages without saying it's all going to be ASCII. And uh, that has all kinds of implications, starting with the fact that you end up trying to figure out like what kind of, what, what character, what, what bracketing card character can I find that isn't used and on the keyboard. And you, you spend an inordinate amount of time on this fine and, and highly intellectual stuff. Uh, but to take a, a, a more complicated example, right, so types. So I've advocated for, for all kinds of things about types. And in particular, so type inference is something where when you talk to the actual programmers, their motivations for type inference are rather different than mine. And part of it, the biggest motivation is they're, they're, they have, the programmers have very delicate fingers. They fall off if they have to type many characters. And so they don't like to type the types. Uh, after that, there's also, yeah, they don't sort of want to see them. Um, and so they, they want type inference to reduce the clutter. Uh, but the whole point of the types is documentation. Well, I think so. Uh, the major point of the types. And also the fact that they're redundant is actually sometimes a good thing because it lets you cross-check more things. Uh, and this is not a problem if you can control when you see them, which you can't in that because if, if you have an ASCII syntax, they're always there, always in your face. And uh, you know, you'd like to have a more civilized way of editing things and so, of course, this, this goes back to environments from the 70s. We won't mention any names. Uh, but maybe we'll finally get there. And, I mean, people finally got around to using IDE, even though the IDE is the Oracle, but at least it's, it's better than, than most editors in some ways. Uh, and you can solve this once you can control this display and have live widgets that you can display or your programming text, right? It also works well with the idea of pluggable types that I've advocated for, because again, there's a system of, you know, who has the privileged syntax? Who gets to be on the ground floor and put their type syntax in where it's convenient to, to have? This problem disappears, right? So, so generally going to these literate text editors, you know, programming editors has, has other benefits, uh, at least for people like me. So there are challenges. Um, because, again, if, if, if the main vector for using this is the web, uh, because at least it has an editor model where you can put in live widgets and you can distribute it to everyone and so forth, then, you know, everything is incredibly painful. And, and when you take, well, you know, time-traveling debugging, which is hard to do to begin with, even the things that are easy to do are hard to do on the web. 
I mean, <coughs> figure out where the damn cursor is, is is apparently a major challenge because you know the API is so cleverly designed. And so, uh, how you know, I think you probably could do it with enough uh, filling up local storage on the web browser unless it has some some arbitrary size limit. <coughs> but uh, there, there's lots of work to be done to actually make this really fly as a full-fledged environment. But uh, we're getting there. And so you're the audience for this, right? Because I know that most programmers really don't care about literacy and literate programmers. So they really do not. Uh, I do think it has a benefit. One of the points Knuth makes uh, is that it's a transformative thing. It's not just about teaching and exposition. It's about this idea that when you tell a story, you may, when you, you just go out to the trouble of describing and writing it, you may learn something about it that wasn't obvious to you before. When you actually write it out, it will force you to think about it. You will, as you explain what you did, you will realize what else you've done wrong or what else could be improved. And so it's a, it's, it's a good thing to, to force, you know, to give people the opportunity, shall we say, uh, to, to do that. It's not just about teaching people, it's about people teaching themselves. Uh, so uh, you're, you're kind of the audience for this. And so uh, I've been trying to get your attention. And uh, you know we can I, I, this this can be made real. Uh, you know I, I am always uh, looking for for someone foolish enough to volunteer and kind of uh, help contribute to like my my brand of effort on this because it's all very much a spare time activity. Uh, but uh, you know we can we can bring uh, literate programming back from the dead. So. Uh, that's pretty much it, and uh, thank you very much. It's a, it's a kind of invariant. It's, it's something that is true for an infinite number of different possible executions. Mm -hmm. So if you have a program that is very abstract in nature, like a library, like, like a, say, say a Haskell library that is sufficiently abstract, 
It is. It's a Haskell library. Yes. <laughs> I mean, always having this liveness properly, it, it would be a bit, I don't know, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to go through 10 layers of instantiation just to have some running version of this. So sometimes you really want to, you want to understand the program, the, the invariance of, of a program. Sometimes examples can be misleading. So there's a difference between understanding how to add 2 to 3, that's something different from knowing how to add x to y, because then you can reason about the properties that all kinds of additions have. So I'm not sure I buy this your statement that a life is always better. Uh, so um, it is easy <coughs> to do anatomy lessons on dead corpses, it's true. Um, the, 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 you, you're up to something here. Right, there is advantage. If you, you want to analyze something, don't let it move. Pin it down. It's like butterflies in a collection. It is easier to analyze that way. And you're, I think you're onto something deeper, which is, is the root of this divide of how people look at things. There are the people who want to analyze the world, and there are the people who want to synthesize, who want to create stuff. And of course, there's overlap, but the emphasis are different. There's the people who really want to just analyze it. They want to look, and yes, there are invariants, and that's why we do have the program text. You can still look at it. It won't actually hurt you that you can run it, which, is, which seems to be what you're implying. But it will just give you one more option to see what, what happens in cases where you know, your analysis doesn't carry through. Right? But certainly there are the people who, who want control. And the best control, it's easier to control something that's, that's thinned out. And it, it really is, I think, at the root of it is, is how much are you willing to deal with the unexpected and the dynamic, and how much you want to have absolute certainty and control over over everything? I think that's that's very fundamental to how people look at this. Now, I'd argue that you are welcome to stare at the program as much as you like and use pencil and paper, and and there are very talented and clever people who can work great stuff with that. Because obviously, some sort of planning is necessary here, right? On the other hand, you know. Uh, the claim that you just write it and just it works, okay? It's it is useful to see what the thing actually does. It's called empiricism, uh, and so yeah, I don't think that it can ever harm you. True, but the emphasis is then a bit different. It's like, there, like there's a, the emphasis. That's why this conference is here, right? There are 20 conferences where the emphasis is on keeping everything, you know, freeze dried. And, and analyzing it and so forth. And so there's an issue of balance, right? If I give one talk in, 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 in a year and say the opposite, there are 50 people giving talks at any moment explaining why nothing should ever be you know, like this. And uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's open. And, and, it, and it is exactly that climate that suppresses, you know, that if anyone says something different, than that, then there's a problem, and it lacks rigor, and it lacks theory, and da da da. That is exactly why I think a lot of people are here. Uh, I think you're caricaturing uh, uh, Carson's position. Uh, I'm, I'm here because I want to understand how programs work. In that, I want to understand the dynamics of programs, not the particular instances of the execution of programs. So, so I, I, I think you're, maybe for effect, you're, yeah. you're, being, you're opposing class. And I think you're both looking for the same thing. You're wanting to understand the behavior of the program. The class is not wanting to pin down the program and say, this is what it does on the number 13. So, so yes, we are after the same thing, and yes, I am doing this for effect. That's why they invited me to give the keynote. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, you know, effects again, effects are often considered a bad thing. Going, but, uh, so, so I do effects. But, uh, but uh, the the thing is, Glass said, you know, dead is better than alive, right? He, it was not saying that, you know. I don't mean to caricature it, but yes, he's basically saying that it might be harmful to have these facilities, right? And sure, there's, you know, Niklaus Wirth would, would tell you, just look at the code, right? Uh, I, I remember many years ago, uh, we had a colleague visit us when we were working on the strong talk system, and we showed him, he showed us Oberon, uh, one of the versions of Oberon that had this very nice uh, 
interactive environment where you could embed modules and also what and we being small talkers asked him and where's the debugger he said we don't have a debugger and Nicholas says just look at the code and when you have one of those multi-threaded non-deterministic things yeah just look at the code come back when you're done all right it, there, there's more not everything can be done that way not everything is expected that way it's also true that the reverse is true you can spend too much time locked into a debugging system session instead of sitting back and just looking at the code. So there is a there is judgment here, uh, which is why there are endless problems, because when you bring in human judgment, all is lost. But uh, I do think that, you know, sure, it gives you concrete examples. Uh, any particular run, you know, is a concrete example, and so it's, it's rather difficult to, to do these dynamics. Otherwise, you're looking at a static thing and reasoning about it, which is a very powerful thing, and Klaus is arguing that you know, he doesn't want to, well, it sounded like he didn't want any of his livestock polluting his analysis, right? <coughs> and I'm saying it shouldn't hurt you, it's up to you. If, if, you, if, you, if you keep a knife in your kitchen and say, oh, I'm going to cut myself, you know, it's judgment, right? It's, everything has, has uh, pros and cons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm just, I'm doing the effect because I think the, the one side of this uh, is not getting nearly enough play. Yeah, uh, so basically uh, you've been advocating a, t a tool, uh, but I, I, could you say a few more words about, let's say you have your tool, uh, how would you uh, advocate that a literary programmer should develop programs? I mean, would you be in favor of uh, agile methods, test-driven development? How should people use these things? So, okay, test, uh, agile, I, I won't talk about agile methods, um, but... Um, <laughs> But test-driven development, uh, to an extent, yes, this is a very natural fit in the sense that uh, one of the ways to build up these systems and, and practice to, to get this information is from tests. So a very natural thing, but to some extent, small coppers do today to, to some right? You write, you know, you, you, you have your API and you write a call to it and it should do something. And you do this before your API even exists and you fill it in as you go along. Mm -hmm. Right? That is, is one style of development that to some extent you can do in small enough today. I want to make it easier. I want it to, to make it, yeah, so that you can write your tests and and then you will they should go along with it. But that's that's one way of when you one of the problems here, you go to GitHub and you want to find a new library, where do you get all this state about how it is? Well, it has a test suite from which I ideally would be able to derive, you know, what values would be there, at least exemplar values, right? And there's a problem, there are exemplar values, they're not always there. But they have enormous utility. Uh, they have utility for all kinds of things. Suppose, God forbid, I do not have a static type system. Uh, I know that there are site circles in which this is frowned upon, but suppose I want name completion anyway. <coughs> you know, if I actually have live data, I'm going to be able to get pretty decent name completion without uh, you know, the need for, for a static analysis. It's just an example of a different way of doing things. So having data is not a bad thing. Having live data at all times is not a bad thing. And uh, that, that would certainly play into it. So yeah, tests would probably be a big part of this. And I mean, is there a particular style of development that you think those, I mean, in addition to the test uh, that would go with this, or is there any one way that you should be using it, or? There's a, there, of course, there's, only, there's one way, my way, but um, really, I, I, don't wanna, I, I don't think we have nearly enough experience, and I don't, certainly wouldn't want to dictate this, but I think that having these tools widespread and accessible to the mainstream will unleash, well, it'll unleash some horrible things, I'm pretty sure, too, but it will, it will unleash a lot of creativity, and, we'll find, and there'll be different ways of doing things.